As a little girl, I grew up in the city of Bangalore, which is fondly called the Garden City for its lush environment and cool climate. But you know, even back then in the 90s, this nickname was starting to sound like a bit of a joke. Because sure, about two decades prior, 70% of Bangalore was covered in some form of vegetation. But by the time I came round, that had shrunk to about 40%, and now it's less than 10 As a society, we seem to have accepted these changes as the inevitable consequences of development. But for someone like me, who treats trees over buildings as landmarks, it's become increasingly difficult to recognize my own city. Throughout this, Bangalore's iconic Coven Park, with its 300 acres of greenery, has remained a bit of a refreshing constant. And that's why it means so much to me to participate in this particular TEDx event. While my childhood weekends were spent at Coven Park, school holidays offered the chance to venture a little bit further. So every chance we got, my family and I would get away, escaping to this mountain range that lines the west coast of India, the Western Ghats. For us reluctant city dwellers, it was a magical retreat filled with habitats as diverse as thick jungle and temperate grasslands and swamps. So back then, we'd strike out in hopes of seeing a tiger or a leopard in the wild. And on days that we had no animal encounters, we'd feel a little bit dejected because we'd woken at the crack of dawn and seen nothing. But it was usually only on those days that the more knowledgeable among us would start pointing out the plants, almost in sheer desperation. You know, the wild figs that parakeets and fruit bats feast upon, the flame of the forest flowers that light up the jungle with their fiery orange hue. And it was beautiful, of course, but let's face it, it's no tiger. I've often wondered why the average child could rattle off their top 10 favorite animals but would struggle to identify even the vegetables on their plate. And that thought has led me towards my rather unlikely profession of botanical illustration, the practice of painting plants, usually in watercolor, in a way that aims to be both aesthetically appealing and scientifically accurate. And it's honestly a pretty odd profession for a 21st century urban Indian, and some might even call it outdated in the age of the camera. But anyway, here's how it all began for me. Um, a few years ago, in 2016, I met two ecologists, Divya and Sridhar, who happened to work in these same jungles that I frequented as a child, the Western Ghats. And interestingly, they actually began their careers in zoology. But they soon came to realize that if they were to protect the birds and animals that they love so much, they'd also have to protect their habitats, that's the trees that provide them food and shelter. And so they began a rainforest restoration program focused on growing native trees. And they wanted to document these trees visually, but the photographers they approached found that this was easier said than done. Because the trees were up to 140 feet tall, and that's 26 times my height. Try capturing giants like that in a single camera frame. Besides, the surrounding foliage was so dense that you couldn't clearly see the individual specimen. So together, we thought we'd give painting a shot. And to be honest, even when I was standing there in front of them, I couldn't exactly see the entire tree. So instead, I would study the buttress up close and then climb up a hill to see its crown rising above the canopy. And then with Divya and Sridhar's help, we'd imagine the intervening bits and stitch it all together into one drawing. So over two years, we managed to document 30 of the region's most iconic tree species, along with their fruits, flowers, seeds, and leaves. And for those who don't know the jungles as well as these ecologists, these drawings are probably the only way that they'll see these trees in their entirety. Throughout this whole process, I myself began to see the jungles differently. Sure, I'd visited the region practically every holiday as a child, but had I ever really seen it? These jungles began to evolve from an undifferentiated sea of green into individual species with individual characters. Botanical illustration has been my means of rediscovering a land that I, I already thought I knew, leaving me with the assurance that, tiger or no tiger, I was always sure to see something. While illustration has become my own means of self-learning, I decided to put it to a new test. Could I use this medium to tell plant stories and help others see them differently too? With funding from a nat National Geographic grant, my team and I put together a list of the most incredible plants we could find in the Western Ghats, and we compiled them into a book. This is one of my favorite images from the book. It features a wetland habitat called the Maristica Swamps, named after wild nutmeg plants that dominate the region. 
Since they grow in waterlogged conditions, these aerial roots pop up from the ground, helping the plant breathe and hold firmly to the soil. You can also see a group of lion tail macaques here. They're primates that are endemic to the Western Ghats and which particularly love these swampy habitats. But you'll notice that here I've decided to turn convention on its head, with the animals, the lion tail macaques in the background and the plants in the foreground, in the spotlight for once. And this is an elephant yam. Its gigantic tuber is eaten as a vegetable in villages across India, but its flower is what's really fascinating. You see, it's pollinated by beetles who like to lay their eggs in decaying and rotting matter. So the flower plays a little trick to attract these pollinating beetles. It emits the strong, unmistakable stench of a rotting flesh. The beetles will soon realize the deception and they'll move on. But the trickster flower's work is done. Because when the beetles do move on, they'll carry the pollen along with it. Or let's take a look at these bejeweled alien-like sundews. They grow in soils with poor nutrient levels, and so they found a way to supplement their dry diets. They lure, capture, and digest insects using mucilaginous glands on their leaf surfaces. Small insects are attracted by the sweet secretions of these glands, but once they come in contact, they are ensnared in sticky substance. And quite cleverly, you'll notice that the sundews hold their flowers on tall, thin stems far above their murderous leaves to avoid trapping potential pollinators. So for me, the stories of these plants are a window into another world, an entire kingdom that is hidden all around us in plain sight. You know, if you went to school in India like I did, I'm fairly certain you would have learned about carnivorous plants with the example of the Venus flytrap, which is a fascinating plant that's native to North America. But it was only as an adult that I'd learned that we had our very own, sundew uh, very own carnivorous plants, the sundews, and they could be found an hour outside Bangalore. So it was important to me to create something that's rooted in the Indian landscape, where the imaginations of children and adults alike can run wild. So with a fresh perspective, if you're in Bangalore or any other part of the world and are planning to visit your local park this weekend, I hope you'll see it differently too. Thank you.